Uh, so thank you for coming to the Evolution of Gaming Hardware, and please welcome Mark Diana from Alienware. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I gotta warn you, I partied really hard last night, so uh, I'm gonna be a little off, but that's all right, we're gonna have fun, right? That's, that's what this is all about, so. Uh, we're gonna talk about the evolution of gaming hardware today, and of course, uh, I'm Mark Diana from Alienware, and we're gonna talk about all kinds of things, but where we're gonna start is in the beginning, woo, in the beginning. So uh, what we have here is, uh, most of you guys probably know this device, okay? So this is a game called Tennis for Two. Uh, William Hickenbottom's uh, Tennis for Two. So in 1958, uh, this device was created to basically kind of be the world's first, or it's considered really the world's first video game. Uh, and what's interesting about this device is the I.O. So check out the, the way people used to, to input on this thing, right? So gaming's come quite a long way. Um, in 1958, this is probably considered really high-end shit, right? I mean, if you found a product like this out there, it was uh, probably worth about $35,000, um, and it cost a hell of a lot to make uh, in terms of man hours and resources and, and, and that, that stuff. Um, Tennis for Two is really important because it kind of opened the door to a lot more things in gaming. Um, and by the way, uh, we're gonna make this interactive. So if anybody wants to just shout out anything, uh, hey, what's this or what's that, or you wanna talk, uh, we have mics out there, so we're just gonna hand you a mic and, and let's, let's make this interactive and fun. Um, so Gaming Gold Rush in the 70s, right? So those of you who, who lived through this, uh, you probably lived through one of the best eras ever. I wasn't around, I was negative 10 at the time. Uh, but this, uh, this era was probably uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting eras, at least I believe to be one of the most interesting eras in gaming, because you had kind of a convergence going on in the industry. You had, um, on one side, you had these arcades, which were filled with uh, uh, adolescent youth, uh, probably stoned out of their mind uh, on 70s stuff. Uh, playing Pong, uh, you had guys um, who were basically developing system, uh, developing systems out there. So you have Magnavox here. This white system is called the Magnavox Odyssey, and uh, Atari uh, up there, which is the 2600, a very famous system. And I I really love the look of this. I wish we we would create a machine these days with some wood paneling on the side, uh, but unfortunately, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But I really like that look, classic look. Um, Pong there in the middle, and then uh, Coleco uh, towards the right. Uh, I'm not sure. Does anybody remember any of these things out there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. These these gaming devices are, in my opinion, the, the, these are the granddaddies. I really really like these machines. Um, but uh, you know, what what basically happened is, like I said, you have this convergence going on. You have uh, people going out into the arcade. It's a highly social thing. You go out, you play Pong, you play Pac-Man. Uh, you play some of these games and uh, you interact, of course. And then you had other companies like uh, Magnavox, Coleco, and Atari uh, splitting the market and going into more of a, a home uh, environment. And unfortunately, what, what this did is basically it split the market up into a lot of different areas. And as, as uh, developers, as you guys, most of you out there are developers, um, there wasn't enough content uh, out there to really make those markets sustainable and long term. So what, what you have is a, just a common economic principle where you create a bubble and then pop. Uh, so in 1977, basically the entire gaming industry crashed. Um, and odd, oddly enough, odd piece of information, uh, my grandfather was the product manager for the Magnavox Odyssey, so that was pretty cool. Um, I had a Magnavox Odyssey growing up, and it was a, a fantastic system. Played the shit out of that thing. Um, but then, Along comes this guy, right? So I think, and I, I mean, how many of you guys agree with me in this room that this is the best console ever made? Yeah, I mean, it is, right? Come on, the NES. The Dreamcast, that was a good one. The Dreamcast was a good console. Uh, Neo Geo, Neo Geo and Dreamcast. Neo Geo is a great system, still is today. And actually, you can buy Neo Geos today. I don't know if you, you know that, but they're still selling them. Uh, NHK. Uh, so. Uh, the, the Nintendo Entertainment System comes on the scene. It gets launched in 1983 uh, in Japan, and uh, it, it, it's basically marketed in Japan as this family entertainment system. 
Uh, so bring the family together and you can get your ass kicked by Mike Tyson. And that was the concept, right? So get everybody in the living room. Uh, for kids uh, and people like myself, I spent probably, geez, this is three months cutting grass, doing odd jobs, everything short of like killing somebody uh, for a contract to get a system. Um, and I saved up all this money and I went out to the store and I, I remember it like it was yesterday. We, we, we picked up the box, went home, turned it on, and I played for probably 14 hours straight. And I was like, I really love this shit. I want to do this shit for a living. And I was about seven or eight. And uh, I put some of this, the, the games up here because I think that, that these games are awesome games, right? So you had Metroid. Uh, Metroid is a fantastic game. Uh, developed uh, one of the first games for the NES. But uh, what's great about Metroid was it kind of opened a lot of doors to say that these games, they, they, you could save. You could save your progress. And actually, the, the original Metroid, you had to punch a code in. Uh, uh, to, to, to basically get back to where you were and it would um, you know, fill your inventory and stuff with, with where you were and, and all your items. Uh, Legend of Zelda had a RAM on the, on the cartridge so you, you could physically save your progress and you know, everyone, I'm sure some of you guys out there, uh, this, this would happen to me every now and then, you would throw your cartridge in, you would hit power and all your save files were gone. Um, that was because static, uh, you know, static electricity out there, moving the cartridges around, um, and of course, everyone had the famous way of getting your Nintendo to start when it was broken. Sometimes you smack it, sometimes you blow into it. I had a friend of mine who used to kick it across the room. That worked really well um, for a while. Uh, but um, of course, Mega Man 2, one of, one of the other uh, more famous games, one of the best soundtracks probably ever on the NES, uh, and Dracula's Curse, so great, great system. But um, what this system did, um, is basically it brought the gaming industry back from the brink, right? So people were extremely, uh, uh, US companies in particular, were extremely cautious about getting back into a market like this um, because these big players, you know, Atari, Magnavox, uh, Coleco, they, they had almost all of them gone bankrupt uh, by trying to support a market like this. And here comes this Japanese player who uh, used to make trading cards. That's how Nintendo started. They made um, like uh, tops, like almost like baseball cards. And uh, they come into the market and they're like, good luck. Um, but it did really well. And it spawned a lot of uh, gaming companies today that are uh, really big. Some are evil, uh, uh, some are not. But um, it, it, really, it really reignited that, um, that, that, uh, that game engine design and development era. But um, what started to happen was uh, really the same thing, but with more um, with a lot more uh, uh, walled garden approach with the consoles. So uh, content was there. People are making content for the NES. Uh, uh, Sega's on the scene. They've, they've got consoles as well. Genesis, great console. Uh, Super Nintendo comes along. People are making games. Or they're, they're getting rich. These companies are doing really well. But on the side, you have these PC developers, right? And these PC development things that are going on, right? So you can see some of the more classic titles that are up here. Um, and what's interesting about the PC ecosystem and what we find uh, as Alienware so interesting even today is, is it embraces uh, an, an open environment, right? And Valve and, 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 uh, and the Steam platform, uh, they've really echoed that environment in a lot of things that they do. And we're going to get to how this makes sense, you know, and where trajectories are going in the future. But um, the PC was a really important uh, device in, in, in fostering this open environment because you didn't have to be on a console. You didn't have to pay um, a Nintendo or Sega to, to, to get on a box. Um, the Alienware system that you see there, that's one of our early systems. That thing was effing huge. It was like this big. Um, and it weighed about, oh God, I want to say 80 pounds. I mean, uh, so it's, it's come a long way from a system like that to you know, something like this, which I think in terms of power, if I'm going to make a guess, the power that we have in this today, in this Steam box, uh, or Steam machine that you guys have seen, uh, is probably equivalent to maybe 10 or 20 of these devices. And uh, this tower we launched back in, I want to say, probably 1998, uh, 2000, that time. So it's come a long way in a, in a really short window. Um, and we'll get into where it's going, too. Okay. 
So when I first started working at Alienware, it was 2004, and I remember I started, and we had this, this guy here, which was a beefy, badass machine. I mean, this thing was this big. And, uh, and that, that was, that was uh, closed, you know? I, I remember because I could wrap my hands around it like that, and it was, it was massive. Um, and we saw a market where people were, by the way, we sold, we sold a ton of those products. We, we, we honestly sold so many of them, it was remarkable, um, because we saw a market where people were demanding high-end horsepower. They're like, hey, I, I not only want to play Unreal 3, but I want to play with all the settings jacked up. I want to play with every dial and knob jacked up, but I also want a system that's portable. And we struggled for a while because we were, uh, we were probably the, the first manufacturer out there to develop a device like this guy all the way on the left here um, because we didn't know what to call it. We were like, I don't know if we can get away with calling this thing a notebook. It, it's going to hurt your back. Like If you carry it around on a backpack for a weekend, you're going to have to go see a chiropractor on Monday. Um, and the system... The system uh, was an expensive system as well, and people were willing to invest in this because, you know, it, it's a, it's gaming is a, it, the thing about gaming that's so interesting is it's passion, right? It's a passionate industry. You guys are, are developers and creators and, and artists and, and animators, and it's a passionate industry, and, and, and people are willing to back that passion with, um, with, with hard-earned money. And a system like this, it, 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 was a, it was a great device at the time. So we called it a desktop replacement. <laughs> because we, we couldn't you know, get by with calling it a, a laptop. Uh, the system in the middle uh, was our newer system that we launched. It was called our M17X. Uh, uh, and that system uh, really spawned a new direction for us as a company with a new ID, new look and feel. We went from a company that was really like kind of sci-fi-ish, kind of futuristic. Uh, we had the, our trademark, like what we call the Alien Gills. Um, and then we went to a sleeker look. We went to... A lot of the design was inspired by companies like uh, Lamborghini, uh, Porsche. We wanted to get more into materials that were higher end, so we used materials like uh, uh, aluminum. We used materials like carbon fiber. Um, and it was, it, was, it was really fun, I got to tell you, to work on products like this because uh, they're beautiful. At the end of the day, like, you, you, you can feel the build quality. You know it's a premium product. Um, and then we, we have the XPS. I put two towers here, but... Uh, compared to the previous tower that was over here. So believe it or not, those are actually bigger. Um, so as, as uh, technology was increasing, uh, in our field, things got bigger instead of smaller. So it was kind of different. We had uh, uh, you know, Dell and other uh, uh, companies over here, and technology was getting faster, and performance was getting better, and power draw was, was decreasing, but form factor was decreasing as well with it. Uh, with ours, uh, system sizes grew. The XPS system was, I think, fully configured. In the, when it shipped in the box, I remember the weight on that because it was 140 pounds. 140 pounds showing up at your front door. And let me tell you, that was probably uh, uh, the happiest day of your life when you got a system like that at the front door. It's a really cool experience, the whole out-of-box thing that we do. It's, it's awesome. Um, but that system out of the box weighed about 80 pounds. Uh, really heavy system, but again, premium uh, materials. The system all the way to the r uh, right there, that's our Area 51 system. And we, when we designed the system, we were, we were getting really crazy. I mean, some of, some of these guys who design uh, products for us, they're, they're incredible human beings, and the things that they think of are like really zany. And, and it, it's funny, you know when you come to the idea because you're writing shit down on a board, and you're like, yeah, let's do that one. The, the one that sounds like entirely stupid, and, and that's what the gills, that's, what, that's how the active venting system got created. We were like, what if the top of the PC had gills? And the gills would open up when your computer got hot, and that's where the exhaust ports and the heat would, would be removed. And so we made it, and you know what? It's awesome. Uh, and it works today. We, we, use, uh, um, we use different active venting methods on our system today, but, uh, but predominantly, uh, we're gonna take a different direction in the future. Uh, but you'll always see stuff like that from, from us. But um, a lot of performance that you see with the PC today is predominantly driven through graphics, right? And the reason why uh, it's predominantly driven through graphics is we have different upgrade cycles from the consoles, as you guys know. So the consoles just went through a, a very long uh, upgrade cycle. I believe it was like eight years uh, for both platforms. 
And for the PC, we've been able to you know, constantly stay on the game by getting uh, uh, you know, high-end graphics solutions from our partners. Um, so I just put like a quick little chronicle here to show you guys you know, how far it's come. All right, so let's talk about Steam. So digital explosion with Steam, right? So Steam gets on the scene in uh, late 2003. Um, and a lot of you guys out there remember this. I know I do um, because I picked up Half-Life 2. And I was like, what the hell is this? What, what, is, this, what is this Steam thing? So as Steam uh, uh, begins to grow and as people begin to use it, uh, what becomes interesting about it is, is not only does it provide a platform for you guys as developers to, to push the titles that you want and interact with the marketplace that really wasn't, wasn't around uh, before Steam, but what's interesting about it is the community aspect as well. So uh, the, the, the Steam customer is very different from, um, from your, your typical like, console customer. Um, in fact, internally, we have a, a name for some of them called Alpha Influencers because they go out there and they talk and talk and talk about technology and they talk about their products and they're, they're, they can be really, really good for you or they can be really bad. Um, if you put a product out there that's no good, uh, they're gonna tell you, you know, this, is, this product is shit, it's no bueno, and you're not gonna sell anything. Um, we, we would like to think as um, the Steam community, as a community that is uh, really active, but it's also a community that we have to do justice by. Um, and what I mean by that is with these new platforms out there now with Steam machines and, and the evolution of where Steam OS is going, uh, we really have to get it right with this customer first before we can start talking about, hey, well, what about the console market? You know, should I buy a Steam machine or should I buy a PlayStation 4? Um, we know that the customer that we really want to target and we really want to do right by is that Steam customer. So um, with, with Steam, what really happened is, again, through uh, really throughout uh, uh, the 2000s um, and up and of course up until now, um, Steam began to just grow and grow and grow. And a lot of people, you know, we 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 as Alienware, we we read articles, we get uh, uh, information from companies like IDG and all these you know fancy big wig companies come in and they tell us, well, PC is dead, PC is dying, they, gaming is dead, and gaming PCs are dying. And we're like, really? Because we're selling truckloads of this shit and. We think that it's it's a great market. We think that people out there are are hungry for something different. You know, there's people out there who don't want to be uh, put in a box, and and we think that this platform is the best platform for innovation. Um, and and we we uh, we continue to invest in it, and that's why uh, today uh, we have Steam machines. So um, Steam machines are really that next evolution in hardware design and PC innovation. Um, and uh, I had another video here. Should we risk it? Should we give it a whirl and see? No? It's going to be awkward anyways. Who cares? This is a great video The Verge did uh, out of CES. Oh, the advertisement will work. We know that. But I can skip it in five. Well, wow, this is pretty bad, guys. The internet sucks. I mean, we're not even getting the ad to flow. Huh? Let's see if it works. Mr. Greg Coomer from Valve is in this. All right, come on. The next generation of game consoles are here, but they won't be alone. This is a Steam Machine, a new category of game system designed for the living room. Three years ago, Valve, the company behind the Half-Life and Portal games, devised an ambitious plan Internet fail. That's a shame. I really wanted you guys to see this. Go on your phones later and check it out. It's awesome. This time I'm going to close it. OK. So essentially, and I'm just going to see if I can remember everything that's in the video because I don't want to leave out any important things. But essentially, what, what's going on is um, we are, we are actively investing in bringing Steam to different rooms uh, uh, and helping Valve do that. So for over a year, uh, we've been working on this platform and this design. And uh, I have the product here. If you haven't seen it, uh, when, when we get done with the presentation, definitely check it out. But what's different about our product is we, we basically 
And the way we work as Alienware is we basically have this Willy Wonka candy shop uh, in the corner, and that's the Dell Engineering Lab, right? And uh, I think uh, uh, Dell today probably has around 60,000 employees. Uh, the Alienware unit is 35 people uh, inside of Dell. So we, we, we operate like this little Navy SEAL team, and we're able to leverage and pull all these resources from the, the larger uh, mothership and incorporate some of those uh, specs and engineering and design into products that we want to make. So it's, it's kind of cool. We have, we have like the best of both worlds. And we, we, we really do run in a lot of ways like a, like a small, wholly owned subsidiary inside of Dell. Um, but what, what makes this product interesting is, as you can see, it's, it's size, right? So it's incredibly small. And, and the reason why it's small is we're able to create, again, using those resources, our own motherboard that goes into this product. So the, the, the product itself, uh, you won't be able to buy the board that goes in here and like build a, a type of product like this. Um, but when we, when we started you know, taking a look at what we wanted to do with a box like this, um, it's basically designed to slide into a media rack, right? Underneath your TV, uh, right next to, if you had a gaming console uh, or you're throwing one out because you're tired of that thing, uh, definitely get this product, put it under there. Uh, and all the, all the venting was designed around that type of form, uh, uh, media center rack. So underneath, we developed this new uh, venting system that basically sucks in cold air all around the sides like this, and we put two large heat sinks here in, uh, um, in the product on the roof, and then heats exhaust out in the back. Uh, the product's gonna have HDMI out, so your primary video source will come out with HDMI. Uh, power brick will be external. Um, gigabit Ethernet, two uh, HDMI, or sorry, two um, USB 3.0, and uh, optical. There'll be two USB 3.0 in the front. There's no optical drive, as you can see, because we know that the majority of people that buy this product are gonna download uh, 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 their titles for, for Steam. You can hook an optical drive up to it, but when was the last time you bought a piece of optical media? It's probably been quite some time. Um, so don't let its size fool you. It's gonna be incredibly powerful, and I think that when it launches, there's gonna be a lot of people in the room who go, holy shit, I can't believe that Alienware is selling a product that has that performance for just an unbelievable price. Um, so I can tell you that if, if there's stigmas out there uh, about us being expensive, um, expect those stigmas to shatter. Uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, uh, why is the Valve logo kind of like pointing downward like this? That's because most meteor racks uh, are like high gloss and shiny, and the logo will like reflect so it adds like a nice touch there to the, to the meteor rack. Okay, let's talk about the, the future of gaming. I'm not sure how I'm doing with time. How am I doing with time, guys? Because this is where shit's gonna get really weird. It's gonna get bizarre, and then it's gonna get a little awkward. Okay, so um, the future of gaming, right? So Oculus is here, uh, um, they're doing some demos. Uh, if you haven't seen a lot of these products out there, then you've been living under a rock. Um, these things are basically making a lot of headlines in a lot of ways for a lot of different reasons. And I think that, um, the, that uh, the, you know, the way that we kind of look at it is, it, it, it's, it's like an immature virtual reality. And what I mean by that is, when we think of VR and we think of where it's going into either even VR or AR, it's really immersive. It's incredibly immersive. It's, it, in fact, true VR is designed to be really more like the matrix, right? Where you can't decipher, you can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Um, and IO and inputs are happening the way you would naturally have them move. Like you, your brain tells you to move your arms, you move your arms, right? So that type of environment, that IO, that interaction that's gonna happen, that's gonna happen much later. But in the next 10 years, we're gonna see a lot more of devices like this. So, for example, the Riff, um, that device, theoretically, you, you could plug it right into here and you could play the titles that you guys make on an Oculus Riff if it's supported um, through, a, through a Steam Machine device. Um, this, this other product here, this is one that's made by Sony. It's got some, there's two different versions here. One of them's got like a head tracking uh, uh, camera on it. You can see it over there. Uh, that basically works so that when you when you move your head like that, it actually like moves moves around. Oculus did a new um, demo. Uh, you guys should definitely check it out. It's called I believe it's called Crystal Cave. Um, it was done in CES, and the way that they they use a tracking uh, device on it is actually pretty interesting. It's a lot of LED diodes that are on the Oculus device, and there's a camera that tracks the LED diodes, and the movement of your head is tracked very precise or very precisely. It's 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 just an incredible way of interacting with a game versus like moving a control and having to like 
look as you're moving the control. So it's more intuitive. It's, it's, less, of a, um, it's less of an unnatural experience. But um, this, is, this is definitely not going to be like the virtual reality of Hollywood. If you guys remember, um, I, think, I think for me, I don't know about you guys, but for me, the, the one movie that kind of like, I was like, oh, God, what is this virtual reality thing? It was a terrible movie called La Man. I don't know if you guys remember this movie, but it was god-awful. And um, uh, in The La Man, essentially, he was in like a full, like, haptic suit. And that type of virtual reality, or like what I like to call like Hollywood virtual reality, um, that's nothing like this. This is, this is really more of a way to interact with today's products in a, in a method where um, uh, you're not looking at a screen essentially. So it's just a different way of interacting with them. But then things get a little weird. Um, and what I mean by that is in the next probably, well, I think it's going to be in like the next 20 years, um, there's going to be a lot of stuff out there that, that crosses uh, ethical boundaries. So you're going to see, do you guys remember when uh, it was, it was kind of shocking? It was like, uh, the government, uh, politics, big politics. I think Hillary Clinton was one of them too that found out that there was like blood in video games and all the parents were in an uproar. Oh, Mortal Kombat has blood and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, yeah, it's been around for like 10 years. Where have you guys been? Um, you're going to start to see that with this. And what I mean by that is you're going to start to see government come in and be like, hey, um, yeah, we're not so sure about having all these uh, 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 experiences happen to you where you're sitting in a room for 25 hours and your body's experiencing different feelings and different uh, uh, sensory overloads. And I put some books up here and some movies because a lot of these topics, they aren't far off. Um, and a lot of these are going to be situations that you guys as developers are going to grapple with, right? Uh, so one of the books is, is a great book by Ernest Klein. It's called Ready Player One. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the theme here, which is kind of strange, is, is a dystopian theme, right? Like, the future is jacked up in every one of these uh, 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 books. Uh, of course, Bradbury's 451's up there because um, eventually, you know, there'll be limitations on, on what you can do. Strange Days is a really good movie. Uh, uh, essentially, the way Strange Days works or the theme of it, and I won't spoil it for you guys if you haven't seen it, but I'm sure most of you have. Um, it's like a device that gets put on your brain and it's not VR, you close your eyes, but you're essentially, it is VR, and it's interacting directly with your brain. Um, and what's happening is uh, you get to experience everything, every sort of emotion, every feeling uh, that someone else in reality experienced. So there's a host person who basically records their emotions and their sensory, their, their, their feelings and their sensors, and then multiple people out there with these devices can experience exactly what they felt. Um, and it gets weird because there's people out there who want to do some kinky shit, right? And there's people out there who want to uh, experience weird things. And all of this as a developer, or as developers, all of, all of this has a theme, again, that you guys are going to have to grapple with because as this stuff does begin, be as the lines between reality and what's real and not begin to blur so great, um, you know, what do you do? What, what do you make, you know, as, as a... As a um, as an institution uh, and as a, you know, a collective of people out there making games, like, are you okay with somebody dying because they played your game for 35 hours? And again, this is not far off. I mean, you guys have seen some of the articles in, in China of, of some, poor, some poor kid, some poor bastard who's played WoW for like 48 hours and he just collapses dead in his chair. I mean, you know, th these types of sensory feelings that we get, the endorphins, the, the, the experiences, the, the chemical, uh, stimuli that happens to the brain, um, it's, it's going to make for an interesting future, and it's all going to be completely virtual. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of these things, if, we're, if we take a step back and we say, well, it's not going to be that bad. It won't. It won't be that bad. In a lot of ways, uh, a lot of this, is, it's still very dramatized, very Hollywood. But there's a lot of industries out there that can benefit from VR, and we're already seeing some of those today, right? Like healthcare, um, uh, auto mechanic design, uh, or just, just general design, period. Um, and of course, physics, right? You can, you can do, uh, you can explain to uh, 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 a classroom full of kids how physics work in an environment that's entirely virtual by destroying things and seeing, you know, the way they collapse or, or interacting with mathematical problems in different ways uh, in a virtual world. 
Um, and that gives uh, uh, kids and, and education a, a powerful new tool to, uh, in which to learn. So, so that's, that's really it. Um, I know, boring, I know, I know. Uh, but I wanted to open up the floor for QA um, and see if anybody wanted to ask a question. If it's a dumb question, I'm going to give you a real dumb answer. Hi. Um, I want to ask a question you probably can't answer. But, oh, um, yeah. The Alienware box, what is the approximate price going to be like on that? That is a question I can't answer. Um, uh, well, I suppose I, I should ask you how much money you have in your pocket. Um, we can start there. Zero? You have credit cards, though, right? I can take those. Um, so the price, what I can say about the price and what I can say about the performance is it will be very comparable to the next generation of consoles in both price and performance. That's a, that's a, a, a very PRZ answer. I'm sorry. I hate those answers, but they, they made me say it. They always do. Yes, back there. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, what the uh, power supply was like on the uh, AC adapter for the Alienware box up there, and if the AC adapter will be larger than the box itself. No. Okay. I can't answer that. No. No. No, I can answer it. Uh, so uh, the, the power supply that's going to be in this unit, um, geez, I wonder if I should tell you the wattage. I don't think I will. I'm already in enough trouble. Uh, so. Uh, the power brick is probably going to be a little larger than the brick that you see here. Um, and the reason why we chose to have the brick live outside of the box is because the PSU is a, a typically a high, uh, generates a lot of heat, right? Um, and if you see a lot of the systems that are up there, uh, that are out there, and I, I, I actually don't, a lot of people are asking, you know, how, how do you feel about the other platforms and stuff? And, do you see them as competitors? And we actually don't really see them as competitors, not just yet. We really see them as partners in getting this ecosystem right. But when you design your own board like this, you can, you can leverage, again, Dell being the multifaceted company that it is, you can leverage uh, 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 PSU bricks from different sides of the business and have something be external versus be internal. Um, because again, heat is always the enemy. You want to remove as much heat as you can. And by removing the, the, the brick, we're able to hit a smaller form factor like this. So. Again, a little bit of a PRZ answer for you. But if you have money, I'll tell you in the back. Crickets, all right. Oh, there's one back there. Why wasn't the hacker in the book? You are, what'd you say, you're one of the hackers in the books? No. <laughs> uh, why wasn't the hacker and the ants in the book list? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I think that well, okay. So so let's talk about the let's talk about the books for a second. Um, so first off, if you haven't read these two books or these three books, actually, you should definitely read them. Most people required reading in school is four uh, uh, four fifty one. Uh, it's it's a really good book. Um, it's an old book, but it's it's got a lot of themes that are they're really scary. They they deal with again that type of control of information. Um, but on a, on a similar theme, um, probably my favorite up here is definitely Ready Player One. If you haven't read this book, check it out. It's great. It, it's, it's a really good read. It's an easy read. But uh, a lot of the themes in there are, they're, again, dystopian universe and all that stuff going on. But uh, good question, and it probably should be up there. All right. I think we're going to end it. Uh, um, I'll be around outside. Again, I take cash and credit card. Uh, if you want to learn more about the product, uh, just hit me up. And thank you guys so much for uh, listening to my big dumb face uh, chat for so long. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>